thank you for your word to us, your living word. And we ask, O oh God, that you surround us at this time with a heavenly host of angels. Let your anointing flow in this place, O oh God, and help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Happy Easter, everyone. And, uh, and I bring greetings to uh, brothers and sisters who are joining us uh, in the auditorium and at home. Uh, special greetings to you as well. So last Tuesday, a young lady who's not a Christian asked me, why is Easter called Easter? What does it mean? Does anyone know the answer to this? I, I almost started to panic because I had to think very hard and then very loud query, right? If the pastor doesn't even know what Easter means. So then I thought, and then, yeah, there are a few theories, I said. But I think this one is best. So Easter is an English word that evolved from Germanic words, meaning dawn east and sunrise and these words in turn have their own roots in an old german word for resurrection she became silent though when i started to speak about jesus being raised from the dead and this seems to be a bone of contention for many people jesus is a great teacher yes Jesus as a wise and good man, yes, a holy prophet who could do extraordinary things, a resounding yes, but the Son of God, crucified, and on the third day raised from the dead. Hmm. This is what our scripture passage for today confronts us with, and it expects a response. You see, the Gospels, of which John is one, are not just history books. They are written testimonies, real life, largely eyewitness testimonies about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So John's intention is not to give us a blow-by-blow -blow account of all that Jesus did, but these are written, John says, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The resurrection is pivotal to our faith, but it goes completely against the grain of our rational scientific worldview. It's difficult to believe now. It was difficult to believe then. And Jesus' own disciples weren't expecting it. As far as they were concerned, he was dead. And the story ended for at the tomb. Now, Mary Magdalene wasn't expecting it either. After Jesus' burial, she observed the Sabbath. And at the earliest possible moment, it's thought that sometime between 3 to 6 a.m. on Sunday, she goes to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body with spices. John mentions only Mary, but the other Gospels indicate that there were a few other women with her, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so here are some scripture references if you're interested. So here... We have Mary going to perform an act associated with death. She was going to grieve and attend to Jesus' body. You see, the Jews don't embalm the dead. And so they used spices like myrrh to slow down the rate of decomposition and aloes to mask the smell of rotting flesh. Mary didn't expect the resurrection. 
None of them did. So when she arrives at the tomb, she's even more traumatized because the stone to the entrance was removed. And this stone was so heavy, it would have taken several men to move. And by the way, it couldn't be budged from the inside. So she must have peered in, and it was dark, remember, so it must have been a very dark hole indeed. And then she does the wise thing. She runs to get Simon, Peter, and John. And she's going maybe a bit hysterical even. They have taken him out of the tomb. And we don't know where they have laid him. So who was she referring to by they? Grave robbers, most likely. The Jewish authorities, possibly. And where were the Roman soldiers who were supposed to have been guarding the grave? From Matthew's account, I surmise that the soldiers must have run away in fear. After a great earthquake shook the place and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven right in front of them, and rolled away the stone. Maybe all it did was to touch a finger on it. Whatever the case, John, Simon Peter, and presumably Mary, proceed to rush to the tomb. So John, the younger one, arrives first. He stands out there, he hesitates, he doesn't enter, but he bends down to look in and what does he see? He sees the linen cloth that was used to wrap Jesus just lying there. Then Peter arrives, and true to form Peter, he rushes straight into the tomb, and he sees the linen wrappings lying there, but he also notices the cloth used to wrap Jesus' head, rolled up by itself. So now, just to give you an idea, that's the cloth rolled up by itself, neatly. Now, just to give you an idea, the burial chamber was likely to have been one with what they called shelf graves on either side. And it's thought that Jesus was laid to rest in a trough-like grave carved into the side of the tomb. And this is a picture of what uh, some believe to be his grave at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So, you know, in an idle moment to alleviate my stress of preparing this message, I started imagining how might our pastors have reacted if they had been there with John and Simon Peter. What do you think? So first, we have the unflappable Pastor Gilbert. And he's coming in and then he's saying, okay, the stone is rolled away. Yeah. The tomb is empty. The grave clothes lying there. Head wrapping in a separate place. No sign of Roman soldiers, no sign of disturbance or fight. So he says to the others, well, Jesus had said 22 days ago that he would rise from the dead. Fact. If this has really happened, just as he said, then in my overall cost-benefit analysis, it looks like a net benefit for us to believe in the resurrection. So then Pastor Joshua runs up. Huh, I just heard the news. What happened now? Huh? What happened? Does anyone need help? Is everyone okay? He's such a sweetie, you know. And then he's probably got file in hand, and then he's saying, eh, according to the pastor's schedule, all of us should be preparing or in service right now. What are you all doing out here? Then we got Pastor Kaiming. 
Pastor Kai Ming, I call him the Ninja Turtle. I, I asked his wife in the toilet, how do you think your husband would have reacted? She looked at me and then she said, actually, uh, I also don't know, Lee. He might be unpredictable in his response. So I'm just thinking he might have just stood there. He might have laughed. Then he might be scared. Why are you so scared, guys? Come on, we got God with us and I've got the machine gun. Let's chong! Pastor Ben. <laughs> the faithful Methodist is actually by the side there looking on. And then he... After everyone has spoken, he would probably say, God is at work somehow. Let us reflect on his hand in this. And then he'll probably burst out into song. <laughs> and because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Ay. Anyway, John saw and believed, somewhat. But it was already dawning upon him that perhaps Jesus had indeed risen from the dead. Something he saw inside the tomb made him believe. There's a professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, uh, D.A. Carson. Now he says that most of the early witnesses came to faith in Jesus as the resurrected Lord, not because they couldn't find his corpse, but because they found Christ alive. And you can find details of that in 1 Corinthians 15. John, however, came to such faith before he saw Jesus in his resurrected form. Why? It's because his grave clothes were still there and in the position that they were found. You see, the burial practices of the Jews were distinctive. Dead bodies were wrapped in linen cloths containing dry spices and were placed on their backs in tombs without coffins. So they weren't completely wrapped head to toe. Not like, not mummified, you know, like what you see in some movies or images. According to Henry Latham, who wrote a book called The Risen Master, the face, neck, and upper part of the shoulders were left bare. The head was wrapped separately, cloth twirled around it like a turban. And I can't help but contrast this with the raising of Lazarus from the dead. When Jesus brought Lazarus back to life, he came out of the tomb still wearing his grave cloths, the burial cloth still wrapped around his head. The people had to help unravel him. You see, Lazarus needed the grave clothes once again. Jesus didn't. With Jesus, his resurrection body apparently passed through his grave clothes spices and all, in the same way that he later appeared in a locked room to the disciples. And the late Reverend C.K. Barrett has this to say. It seems that the body in some way disappeared from or passed through the grave clothes and left them lying as they were. John Stott the well-known John Stott says the body was vaporized as if as it became something new and wonderful. If it had been grave robbers, they would have been pretty stupid ones to make all that effort, you know, to get past Roman soldiers guarding the tomb, to break into an eerie grave in the middle of the night, to carefully unwrap the body, and then painstakingly arrange the linen cloths and spices as if the body was still in it, and then carry away a decomposing body, and then leave behind the expensive linen 
and super expensive spices, Pastor Kai Ming would say, Xiao Liao. It wouldn't make any sense. You see, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had wrapped the body in linen wrappings with 100 pounds of spices, myrrh and aloe. And the amount of spices was way over the top because the average person was buried with just one pound. There was enough for 100 burials in Jesus' tomb. I can't verify it, but I learned from a source that the estimated value of 100 pounds of aloes and myrrh in today's terms is about 150 to 200,000 US dollars. John finally saw and believed. Uh, then guys being guys, having settled the issue, Liao, they just went home. Sounds like NS train guys, but, but Mary, ladies, here we are. Mary, she remains standing outside the tomb alone, unconvinced and weeping. But weeping is not adequate description. She was actually sobbing and wailing because the word used in verse 11 is the same word that John used to describe the mourners at Lazarus's grave. So this was like the traditional Eastern death wail. She wasn't expecting anything beyond the confines of death. So she was totally unprepared for what she saw next. Two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the foot. Isn't it amazing that in so doing, God turned a place of death into a tabernacle of grace, a holy sanctuary like what we read about in Exodus. But if we were faced with something like this, would you have done what Mary subsequently does? She says, where is he? They have taken him away. Talk to angels like that. I still don't know. And then turn her back on them. So something, maybe they gestured, you know, look behind you or something. But I just think she was so distraught, so preoccupied with her own grief that she turned her back on angels. When she turns... She doesn't recognize Jesus at first. And it's only when she hears him call her name, Mary, that she believed. My brothers and sisters, the stunning truth of the empty tomb is that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection secures our life death, and resurrection. He has promised this, that if you and I trust in him, remain faithful to him, continue to walk with him, we will be raised to life in the same way too. And it is because he lives that we also will live. Pastor Gilbert on Good Friday said that I would conclude the three-part sermon, which began Monday, Thursday, today. And yes, there is a conclusion. Jesus finished his work on earth. The story did not end in the tomb because the tomb is empty and what we do have is a risen Lord and a living Christ is an all-powerful Christ present Christ, like he was to Mary and the others, a Christ who gives us life now and life in eternity. But the story has not concluded for you and me. And I wonder, 
What might you have come today expecting? What are you expecting of Easter with Jesus? Is it a miracle that you're seeking? Is it an encounter with him that you're seeking? Or have some of us come and we're weeping and wailing internally like Mary, or struggling even with doubt that we dare not tell another fellow Christian in case they, they, they condemn us or tell us off, you know? What is it that we're expecting of Jesus? I want you to know that he calls you, each one of you, by name. There are no coincidences and none of you are here on your own volition. The very fact that you're sitting here sweltering in the heat on a Sunday morning suggests to me that it's the Holy Spirit who has brought you. So, you know, uh, quite a number of years ago, I kind of got an insight into how Mary must have been feeling with the weeping and the wailing. Uh, I got a call from a church member who had a friend who was not a Christian. And this friend's boyfriend died suddenly unexpectedly in her presence. And because of a complicated situation, this friend could not attend to his funeral. And this person, the deceased, was uh, uh, a foreigner and had to be repatriated, his, his body and his casket. And so the friend asked me what to do. So I spoke with uh, the church member's friend and I said to her, I tell you what, you and me, we go to Changi Terminal 1, which is where the flight was going, departing from, with his body in it. And in the middle of the night, she and I stood in front of Changi Terminal 1 departure gates. And I said to her, what do you say to a non-Christian weeping and wailing in such great distress? So I just said, well, for closure, just imagine that he's walking through the departure gates and you just wave goodbye to him, but he's never coming back. So we stood there in the middle of the night and I had this sense that as she wept and as she wailed, as the flight number was announced and as the plane obviously was taking off. It was as if she was looking into, like Mary, a deep, dark hole. For you and me, for you and me, we know that Jesus ascended into heaven and we've got to cling to that truth. And the parting image that I'd like for you to have before you go from here this morning is this. You know what? His funeral shrouds have been removed and royal robes were placed on Jesus. And then he ascended to heaven where he is seated right now at the right hand of God the Father, where he calls you by name where he intercedes for you and he will one day return. I'm going to invite uh, the worship team at this time to uh, minister to us because Jesus stands in the presence of God Almighty in his kingdom. You and I can declare that there is a higher throne than all that we will ever know in this world. And there's a beautiful song where the lyric goes, where faithful ones from every tongue will one day come. 
And one day before the Lamb, we will stand. We will have been made faultless by Him. And our believing hearts will find His promised grace. Salvation comes. This song is one I've given instructions to um, my husband, my friends, my LPA that I once sung at my funeral. So now you all know. And if you're still alive and I'm at my funeral, this is the song. Chape, Francis, and June, you know, huh? Yes. And I'm going to invite them to minister to us. And at some point, I think they're going to invite us to stand to declare.